let me talk just a little bit before going on to the next experiment. Let me just re-emphasize the perspective that I'm trying to sell here on the uncertainty principle. Um, it's not just that we live with an uncertain reality. It's that we have to accept a new logic for the physical world. Um, there are some statements that we can say that don't make sense. Now, we, we know that that's true. We can, I can just say gibberish, and it certainly won't make sense. But here's what's weird about it. Even when two statements, let's say A and B, make sense on their own, such as the electron is in the state X plus and the electron is in the state Y plus, if they're incompatible properties, if these refer to incompatible properties, then the statement A and B, and for that matter A or B, they're meaningless statements. There's no good way to assign a meaning to those statements that works with the rules of logic. Um, that's been known for many, many years, and it, but it's not a way that people usually describe the equivalence, pr the uncertainty principle. And uh, it's, I think it's a really, it deserves to be better known. It doesn't say that it's, it's just automatically false, that if they're incompatible. X plus, the X electron has, has spin X plus and the electron has spin X minus. That's a false statement. They're mutually exclusive possibilities. You can combine them with the word and. It's meaningful and it's false. But it's a deeper, deeper thing and a weird thing that you can't even make sense of x plus and y plus. So let me, I'll, I'll, let me talk about another classic experiment, which shows another, a lot of the similar properties of uh, quantum mechanics, a few different ones, but we're going to kind of see it loops back to that same idea. It's the two-slit two experiment. We have, an, uh, again, a source of stuff, and we're going to look at four cases. One where it's bullets, or you can think darts, like the dartboard example, or water waves, or electrons or light. Uh, in other words, photons, because we actually know that light is made out of particles just like uh, electrons are particles. So we have two, a screen with two slits in it so that the, whatever the, thing, the stuff is can go through these two slits, and then it arri uh, um, goes, ends up on this, this screen here. And to make it more clear what's going on, we have a movable detector. Um, and when we have put the detector here, we sort of detect how much stuff is ending up in the detector. We move it up and down and scan up and down to produce a picture of what happens. Okay, so first example, bullets. Very classical. Here's the source. It shoots out bullets. They're not going to end up over here. They're not going to end up over here because of the slits. They're mostly going to end up here and here, but maybe they'll get deflected, uh, bounce off in some weird way. Actually, that looks like a weird bounce, but anyway. Um, they'll bounce off maybe the edges in a weird way and smear out a little bit, and maybe there'll be some overlap, okay? And if you have one slit open, you get some sort of distribution of the bullets like this. Now, this is a probability distribution. This records, oh, if you shoot 10,000 times, how many will hit here? How many will it hit here? How many will it hit here? So it's, with bullets, it's fundamentally discrete and probabilistic, which is not that surprising, uh, classically. And here is the distribution in red if this only this slit were open. And when you look at these two functions, I didn't draw it terribly well, but what I'm trying to suggest is that when you look at the probability at any particular point of getting hit with one slit open or getting hit with the other slit open separately, you just add those probabilities. So the probabilities add in a very normal way, just like 37% probability with this slit open to hit a certain point plus 23, just 37 plus 23 is 60, and you get the sum. Very simple, okay? So it's discrete, it's probabilistic, the probabilities add in the usual way, and there's no what, what we could refer to as interference or superposition effects, which we're gonna see right now. Here's the next classical example, water waves, a very different phenomenon as far as we can tell classically. So the source, we just make some waves here, just have maybe something bobbing up and down, we have waves coming out, and what happens with the waves is when they hit the screen, most of the time nothing happens, but they can go through these two slits. And it's as if you kind of have two sources of waves separately. Now, what we could do is have only the top slit open, in which case only these purple waves show up, and we get uh, a uh, distribution of intensity of wave here. Now, this is not a probability of some discrete phenomenon. The waves are continuous, and they're just bobbing up and down, and this just measures the intensity of the wave. Here, the red and the red here measures what happens if only the bottom slit is open. So the intensity profile is that the wave is most intense right in front of the, the opening and then less intense over here and over here. And what's interesting here is that the way waves work out is that when both slits are open, you get a rather complicated pattern. 
and it was very hard to draw this freehand sideways on uh, um, using uh, PowerPoint, so it looks pretty crappy. But what it's supposed to be is this kind of oscillation of intensity with peaks and troughs. What's happening here is that if you're in the middle, for example, then the peaks of the waves are going to tend to come at the exact same time and amplify each other. If you're a little bit away from that, though, the peak of the red wave is going to come at the same time as a, a trough of the purple wave, and they will actually tend to cancel each other out. In principle, they can cancel each other, other out exactly, and you get a very small intensity. So the graph, this continuous graph of intensity, has a very much more interesting structure because of the oscillating nature of the waves. So to sum up, it's not discrete. It's a continuous. There are genuine shades of gray in terms of waves. It's a, a scale that, that doesn't um, have just up or down or top, top or bottom or plus or minus. Um, but we get interference effects. We get a complicated pattern of high and low due to the interaction of the crests and the troughs. Here's what happens with electrons or photons. In other words, if you do this with light. And you have to, with light, you have to make sure you do it with a fairly weak light source so that it's not sort of overwhelmed by a huge number of photons. But it certainly works. Um, what you discover is that it's discrete and probabilistic. You attach a counter here, it will get either three electrons or four electrons. It will never get three and a half electrons. It's a discrete kind of thing. They come in lumps. They're quantized. To use the original word, the meaning of the word quantum. Um, and it's probabilistic. The, the graph here, for example, this purple graph, is a graph, just like with the bullets, of the probability that you're going to get a, a bullet if you put the detector right here. But unlike usual probabilities in bullets, when you, put, when you open up both slits, you get interference effects. This is deeply, deeply weird. That somehow, even though they seem to be behaving like bullets, the probabilities don't add. And even though, like right in, like a little off the middle, like right here, for example, even though when one, when one slit is open, you get a significant probability, and when the other slit is open separately, you get a significant probability of a hit, somehow putting, making more ways for these discrete objects to go through the slits suddenly, somehow cancels it out. So the first thing we can say is that, that the um, fundamental particles behave both like particles and waves, in some way. Or you could be more skeptical and say, well, let's just say they don't behave like either. Maybe it's, it's a little too hard to reconcile this. Okay? But the more disturbing thing is that given that it's discrete, how could this cancellation be happening? The waves, the cancellation is happening because some part of the wave energy is simultaneously going through this slit and going through this slit. And it just happens to be that an up crest, let's go back to that picture, an up crest of the purple wave energy is canceling out a down crest of the red energy or vice versa. And that's because you can split the energy between the two. And so the wave is really, the energy is simultaneously going through both slits and that can create an interesting interference at the screen here. But if it's discrete, if we've got, um, if we've got a discrete situation, it seems like the electron is going either through this slit or this slit. And if it's only going, only going through one, how can it possibly interfere with itself or with another half electron or whatever? Okay, So that's why this is deeply strange, that the discrete nature seems to rule out this possibility, and yet we clearly see this when we do the experiment. So here's the question. Given a particular electron, which slit it go, did it go through? Let's just let, let the electrons through, like one every minute or something. and we. We let it through, we detect it in a certain place, we let another one through, detect it in a certain place. Given any particular electron, which slit did it actually go through? And the very interesting question, the answer to that is that it's not meaningful to answer that question. There is no definite answer to that question. And that's very, very strange. That we our intuition for discrete lumpy things, particles, is that there should be a definite answer to that question. Okay, well, Let's not just philosophize about it. Let's do the experiment. Let's see if we can figure it out. Let's place a little detector near this slit and maybe another detector near this. We only need one, really. We'll place a little detector near this slit and see it and observe it as it goes by. Okay, That should tell us the answer to this question. Well, what happens is that when you actually do that, it destroys the interference pattern. It goes from this pattern. Um, ooh, I should have I should have copied a different one. It goes from that pattern to this pattern. When you know which slit the electron is going through, 
suddenly it turns into the classical situation where they actually are behaving like ordinary bullets and there is no interference. That's wild. Okay. So let's see, go back to the next one. Okay. If you place a detector near one of the slits, it destroys this interference pattern. This goes away. And it changes this idea of the superposition, which behaves like adding waves, to the ordinary addition of probabilities, which is how bullets behave. There's a fancy name for this nowadays that people study this more, more specially, um, and it's called decoherence. The idea of the, the coherent weirdness of quantum mechanics fizzling out and um, becoming like ordinary probability has a, has a name. It's called decoherence. So let's, let me talk about a slightly cleverer experiment. What if instead of having, so you can kind of understand this, again, at a level that's, that's not ideal, um, but you can kind of start to understand it by the idea that when you detect, when you put a detector here, you're necessarily affecting the electron in some way. And again, I think it's better to have a, a sort of more deeper logical understanding of it. But you can sort of think about, oh, I actually just, there's no way to observe it without affecting it, and that effect of the electron changes this pattern to the classical pattern. Okay. But what about a cleverer experiment? You don't actually try to measure the, um, to affect the electron at all. You don't, you don't watch it at all, and so you shouldn't be dire directly affecting it. You measure the recoil of the screen as the electron gets deflected. There should be, a, if this screen is really light, made out of a very lightweight material, as the electron goes boom and boom like this and shows up in a particular place, you should be able to notice that that screen, that part of the screen, got kicked up just a tiny bit by conservation of momentum. And there's really every reason to believe that that's, that's still satisfied, that classical law. So you measure the recoil of the screen. You can, it turns out, you can see that if you do the experiment correctly. And it'll tell us indirectly which slit it went through. Okay. But there's a, a nice reason why that's, um, that's not going to work. It turns out that that also destroys the, um, the interference pattern, even though you're trying to be tricky and be ind indirect about it. And the reason for that is that knowing the recoil is about measuring the precise nature of the electron's momentum. And it turns out that that, if you know the momentum really precisely, it turns out to make precise knowledge of the position impossible. And it turns out that momentum and position are the two most famous examples of incompatible properties. I started out with some fairly abstract properties that we didn't talk a lot about the pure physics of, with spin and plus or minus, things like that, because they're very formal and, and very simple with the stern gerlach experiment. But just like the x plus and the y plus, the, the idea of measuring the x direction of the spin and the y direction of the spin and figuring out whether the plus, plus or minus, just like these two properties are incompatible, it turns out that momentum and position are incompatible properties. Or more precisely, knowing the momentum very, very precisely and knowing the position very, very precisely, those are incompatible properties in the same way. It just doesn't make sense to put them together. Okay, So here's the precise statement of that. And again, this is a little bit different perspective from what you'd see um, from other talks about the uncertainty principle. The statement that the electron is at a certain very precise position is a sensible statement. And now, depending on how precise you want to be, it might be hard to be sure to ascertain that. But in principle, it's going to make sense. And separately, the statement that the electron has a certain momentum. That makes sense separately as well. But here's what doesn't make sense. To say the electron is at a certain position and the electron has a certain momentum. It just doesn't make any sense. And I'm not going to go in this direction, but it turns out that it's re it really shouldn't be hard to convince somebody who's taking sort of a basic regular qu college quantum mechanics class of this by looking at how electrons are, are defined in quantum mechanics in terms of wave, wave functions. Um, this is really not, it's not how you usually hear it, but it's not remotely, uh, uh, not really a weird way to say this. And so it's, it's really well understood that this, this statement just doesn't even have a meaning, much less it's false. It just doesn't have a meaning. It's a good place to stop this section.